Tonight, NLC suspends five-day warning strike in Kaduna following federal government's decision to hold reconciliatory talks between the workers and Kaduna state government. Senate holds plenary next week to hold public hearings across the six geopolitical zones of the country on amendment of the 1999 constitution. More INEC officers attacked, this time in neighboring state. INEC chairman warns that an incident threatened conduct of future elections. And as world leaders push for de-escalation of the Israel-Palestine conflict, Prime Minister Netanyahu vows more airstrikes on Gaza. Plus business, sports, news from Abuja, and later international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, federal government unveils Southwest first ever rice pyramid scheme in Ikita State under Central Bank's Anchor Borrowers Program. On sports news tonight, the Nigeria Football Federation announces the Super Eagles will face CONCACAF Gold Cup holders Mexico in a friendly in LA, that's Los Angeles, on July the 3rd. And from Abuja, federal government says national carrier set to take off in the first quarter of 2022 insists the airline will be run by the private sector for viability. There appears to be a ray of hope for the striking workers in Kaduna State as the leadership of the Nigeria Labour Congress announced the temporary suspension of the five-day warning strike which entered its third day today. This is to allow the leadership of the Labour Movement the chance to honour the invitation by the federal government for a consolatory meeting tomorrow between the Labour leaders and the Kaduna State Government. This means a protest which has disrupted business and official activities in the state in the last three days has been put on hold for now. Huh? An official letter was actually communicated to the NLC National Headquarters signed by the Minister of Labour, Dr. Chris Ingege. And all of us also must have seen the decision of the Federal Executive Council to say that intervention should be made and all parties should be brought to the negotiation table to look at the issue at stake with the aim of resolving them. And having received this letter officially, NAC and Central Working Committee just concluded its meeting and told that it's important we honor this meeting. We also decided that in going further to try to have this dialogue, that the action will be suspended and the suspension will take effect tonight. And therefore, we thought that this is a very important decision of the organ that we must also convey to you members of the press, but also the general public. Before the Labour movement announced the suspension of the strike, the federal government had raised concerns over the escalating unrest in Kaduna State caused by the protests. It's formed part of the deliberations at the Federal Executive Council meeting today, where cabinet members agreed that the Federal Minister of Labour and Employment intervened in the matter, resulting in the Minister of Labour and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngigay, scheduling a conciliatory meeting with the Labour leaders and Kaduna State government officials. The Minister of Information and Culture says the interventions of the Minister of Labor and Productivity and Security Agencies is underway to prevent an escalation. I, the federal government is not fully his arms and already the Minister of uh, Labor and the Productivity has uh, waded in and is in touch with the both the government of Carolina State and also the labor. In addition, the security apparatus all over the country, they have also taken preemptive measures to ensure that um, uh, hoodlums don't take advantage of this, um, uh, of this situation. Uh, in particular, I know that uh, the police has uh, reinforced its um, patrol around the between Kaduna and uh, Abuja so that we do not witness uh, you know kidnappers taking advantage of the advantage of this situation but overall I think uh, the federal government is um, quite concerned and it's uh, doing its best to 
uh, see how the two parties can resolve their misunderstandings, you know, amicably with a, uh, little loss to productivity, little loss to properties, you know, and uh, come back again. Because at the end of the day, they will see all the parties will still come back to the drawing table to agree and hammer out, uh, uh, you know, concessions and uh, agreements. Thank you. The warning strike by the NLC actually ended its third day today and protesters sustained the momentum hit in the streets of Kaduna before the suspension was announced. A group of women also protested along the Independence Way close to the NLC Secretariat. They lamented the lack of electricity supply and water over the past few days. <laughs> It's day three of the protest by organized labor in Kaduna State, and it is now clear that they are determined to force the state government to stop the proposed sack of workers and reinstate those already sacked. Not even the decision by the state government to arrest and prosecute the president of the NLC, Ayuba Waba, or the attack on the workers by thugs on Tuesday could stifle the workers' enthusiasm as the president still leads them out on Wednesday. <laughs> As it was on the second day of the protest, another pro-government group, the Concerned Kaduna Citizens, also hit the streets, displaying banners in support of the state government. They marched from the Nepa roundabout through the Independence Way, all in a bid to orchestrate a clash with the protesting workers who are on the other side. But the timely intervention of security agents prevented that from happening. However, they still managed to have their say. We are appealing to them. They should go back to where they come from and uh, meet with their uh, state chapter, design how to meet the governor and discuss these things amicably within themselves so that let there be dialogue, but not this approach. At the Barao Diko Teaching Hospital, normal activities have been paralyzed due to the absence of nurses to attend to patients. The emergency clinic as well as the patient wards are empty as many patients have been discharged while the few ones with critical cases are attended to by medical doctors. It is true that uh, most of the uh, members of staff in Morodoka Kitchen Hospital, Toronto State University have joined the uh, NLC uh, strike in Kaduna State. Um, um, the number of patients that we normally see have uh, also reduced significantly since the beginning of this uh, strike um, from Monday to uh, today. No doubt, the industrial dispute between organized labor and the Kaduna state government is taking its toll on the economy as many businesses remain closed for three days. With the intention of the federal government and Nigerian Governors Forum to intervene in the face-off as quickly as possible, it is expected that both parties will return to the negotiating table to get things working again. The strike may have been suspended in Kaduna State, but the state government says it is yet to see evidence that the NLC is backing off from its campaign of economic and social sabotage against the people of the state. And that's because electricity is yet to be restored in Kaduna after it was shut down at dawn on Sunday, which according to the state government is in brazen violation of the laws protecting essential services and infrastructure. The state government said in a statement that denying Kaduna people electricity about 18 hours to the advertised commencement of their organized sabotage was akin to putting a gun to the government's head and government has a lawful duty not to indulge blackmail. As they've been asked, the restoring electricity is vital to relieving some of the pain that needless acts of lawlessness have inflicted on residents. It is asking that the decision be reversed. But the Senate has another big task up its sleeves. Uh, Senate President Ahmed Lawan today announced the, the decision to suspend plenary next week to hold public hearings across the six geopolitical zones of the country on amending the 1999 Constitution. 
Senator Lawan says the National Assembly holds on predetermined position, holds no predetermined position on any issue ahead of plans to amend the 1999 constitution. According to him, the public hearings would avail Nigerians the opportunity to make submissions on any issue of interest on areas of amendment in the constitution. This is a very important exercise for our country and I will take this opportunity to appeal to all Nigerians who have one issue or the other that they think the Constitutional Review Committee of the Senate should know and take note and address. It's an opportunity to go to the center nearest to you. We are open. We are plain. We don't have any preconceived or predetermined positions on anything. The numerous issues that Nigerians feel should be addressed to make Nigeria better, to make citizens cured, and enhance the welfare of our people. Staying in the nation's capital, the protests held today, this time by a coalition of civil society organizations who marched to the National Assembly, demanding that lawmakers pass the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. The leadership of the National Assembly had promised to pass the bill before the end of the first quarter of 2021, but that was not the case. The group under the auspices of hashtag Occupy Nigeria accused the leadership of the National Assembly of obstructing the passage of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. This group of civil society organizations may be small, but the reason behind their protest is much bigger. The banners and placards say it all. They're accusing the leadership of the National Assembly of undermining the country's democracy for failing to pass the Electoral Act Amendment Bill almost five months after holding a public hearing. Indeed, Nigerians are concerned that the leadership of the National Assembly has failed to meet two deadlines, December 2020 and March 2021, set for the passage of the bill. We have it on good authority that the Joint Committee of the National Assembly, Assembly has completed the technical process and the bill is ready for third and final reading. Thus, we are left to believe, until proven otherwise, that the leadership of the two houses of the National Assembly are obstructing the transmission of this bill to the plenary. This is not the first of such protests urging the National Assembly to pass the bill, and the protesters say it will be sustained until this all-important bill is passed. Meanwhile, inside the Green Chamber, a lawmaker raises a point of order urging the House to fulfill its promise of delivering on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill in good time, but he is ruled out of order by the Deputy Speaker presiding. I want to beg all of us, this House is a responsible House. I know this house as a house that keeps to our promises. That that promise which we made to Nigerians, we should keep it, Mr. Speaker. And since the report has been laid, let us consider that report so that we can pass this bill to Mr. President for him to assent to it. It's not just that one. Every, every report before us is important for consideration. And when you say, or you're trying to insinuate, we are not responsible. We are very, a very responsible house. And we shall keep to our promises to Nigerians to give them the best by the, by the grace of God. We are a point of order, I will closely say, is out of, it's out of order because uh, there is nothing to insinuate what you are now thinking about. Although it is widely understood that passing the Electoral Act Amendment Bill in good time before the next general elections would be best for the country. There is no explanation yet from the leadership of the National Assembly on why the report of the electoral committees of both chambers have not been considered. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. In part two after the break, bandits kidnap 18 passengers in Zamfara State as troops repel attack on the Sadal community.
Stay with us. Welcome back. If it has joined us to watch the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. NLC suspends five-day warning strike in Kaduna following federal government's decision to hold reconciliatory talks between workers and Kaduna state government. Senate holds plenary next week to hold public hearings across the six geopolitical zones of the country on amendments of the 1999 constitution. More INEC officers attacked this time in Ebony State. INEC chairman warns that incidents threaten conduct of future elections. And as world leaders push for de-escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Prime Minister Netanyahu vows more airstrikes on Gaza. President Mahmoud Buhari is still in France and has been holding several meetings. Well, we move on to other stories, but with a security on our minds as arsonists are still on the prowl, setting ablaze three officers belonging to the Independent National Electoral Commission in Ebony State. Sensitive and some non-sensitive materials are reported to have been burnt in the incident, which happened in the early hours of today. The attack comes just hours before the scheduled meeting between the Independent National Electoral Commission and heads of security agencies in the state. It is meant to address the same matter, which is a tax on INEC offices. Yeah, thank you. This morning, I got a, a call from three of our local governments that our offices at the local government have been raised by unknown people. Is that not precisely? The Boeing local government and the EZ. Ballot boxes were burnt. The buildings, the reason that the gravity of the destruction was so alarming to the extent that the buildings are collapsing. That is the level. We are proactive. We are having, a, we have informed all the security uh, people of what to do. We have uh, even informed Abuja, the headquarters to know what is going on. Even the commissioner is aware of what is happening and is in Abuja now. These attacks on INEC facilities are a cause of concern for the chairman of the commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, who says he is seriously worried about how these actions can undermine the commission's capacity to organize elections. During an emergency meeting with resident electoral commissioners in Abuja, the chairman emphasized the need to urgently address the problem. Professor Yakubu says he will be meeting with security agencies to seek solution to the problem. In the last three weeks or so, three of our local government offices in Asian Udim in Akwaibom State, Ohafia in Abia State, and Udenu in Inugu State have been set ablaze by unidentified persons. Last Saturday, sorry, last Sunday, 16th May 2021, our state office in Inugu suffered yet another arson and vandalization in which parts of the building were ransacked and several vehicles raised. And more of our facilities are being systematically targeted and attacked. Surely these attacks are no longer freak events, but appear to be quite orchestrated and targeted at INEC. Clearly, these are acts of unjustifiable aggression, which may undermine the Commission's capacity to organize elections and dent the nation's electoral process. The Commission will certainly work with the security agencies to deal with the perpetrators of these heinous crimes according to the law. To this end, a meeting with all the security agencies is holding on Monday, 24th May 2021. In Kaduna State, no fewer than eight persons have been killed by bandits at Ungwangeda village in Chiku local government area. The bandits were said to have invaded the community, shooting sporadically, and in the process shot eight people dead. 
The Kaduna State, uh, Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, says the bandits also burnt down a building belonging to the Assemblies of God Church, as well as other several houses uh, during the attack. And in other developments, the Nigerian Navy's, Navy troops stationed in Kujama General Area killed three bandits and arrested two accomplices after repelling an attack on Wakwudna village near Castle, also in Chiku local government area. According to operational feedback to the Kaduna state government, the troops stationed at the Kujama checkpoint responded to reports of an attack on Wakwudna village and swiftly deployed for intervention. The bandits fled into surrounding bushes on sight of the troops and abandoned some rustled cow cattle, which were rounded up and returned to their owners. The troops also engaged bandits uh, before Castle Village, and in the gunfight, three bandits were neutralized. Bandits also attacked Batsari community in Katsina State, killing one person and abducting 21 others, mostly women and children, in a late-night attack. An eyewitness says heavily armed bandits invaded the area, shooting sporadically, rustling dozens of cattle, stolen property worth millions of dollars, millions of naira, beg your pardon, belonging to the victims, and killing a refugee. A battery is one of the frontline local governments in Katsina State bordering the dreaded Rugu Forest, where activities of armed bandits are persistently on the increase since the resurgence of banditry, cattle rustling, and kidnapping for ransom in the state. And we're in Zamfara State, where 18 passengers have been abducted by bandits. The travelers were in transit along the Dansado Guso Road when the bandits attacked the vehicle they were traveling in. Police authorities say efforts are ongoing to track the bandits and rescue the victims. Meanwhile, security operatives also repelled an attack by bandits in the same local government area. Police say the bandits attempted to attack the community, but were repelled by a combined team of security operatives and no casualty was recorded. However, unspecified number of cattle belonging to locals were rustled by the bandits. The inspector or acting inspector general of police, Usman al Khalibaba, is promising that Nigeria police under his watch will match force to force with groups and violent gangs carrying out attacks on security formations and other state assets in the country. The acting IGP made the comments when he led a high powered delegation of DIGs, AIGs, and CPs from six states of the South South on a courtesy visit to Governor Nyesum Wika of River State today for the launch of a new security initiative codenamed Operation Restore Peace for the South South Region. One day after launching a special security plan codenamed Operation Restore Peace in the Southeast, the Acting Inspector General of Police is in River State to flag off the same security operation for the South South Zone. First, he pays a visit to Government House Port Harcourt to intimate Governor Yetsum Wike of the decision to use the state yes. for the flag of exercise. And he says the time has come for the police to rise up to the occasion to protect the citizens and the state assets. That we need to do something very to restore the peace that is getting out of our hands as a nation especially with the advent of ICO and its military wing, the ECM, taking arms against the state, against the police, against the military, against other security agents, against state assets and other infrastructure. For Governor Yesum Wiki, Nigeria must increase its budget on security and invest more on intelligence gathering while stating his determination to resist secessionist agenda. We put budget in things that do not matter. I will be minister. So I know. So good news about the world, not taking security very, very serious. Security is not only by guns. No. Training is very, very important. Intelligence is key. You can even spend more resources on intelligence than even by the After the visit, the IGP leads its team for the official flag off of the initiative at the Sharks Stadium in Port Harcourt. 
With this new strategy, residents of Patakot and all the South-South states are reassured of improved security and adequate protection. Well, here in Lagos, the State Ministry of Justice has introduced a technology platform called the Justice Clock to fast-track justice delivery in the state. The state's Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Muyoshori Onigbanjo, says you, the sir. Justice Clock is a case management system that will help automate the justice delivery process in the state. The Commissioner for Justice was speaking at the state's 2021 ministerial briefing ahead of Governor Babajido Somolu's two-year anniversary. The Justice Clock is a case management application for the DPP's office. And from when they receive the file from the police, the clock starts to run. So they know that we have told the public that in 14 days, the DPP's advice will be out. So the clock starts running. The clock also doesn't stop after the legal advice is, is issued. It continues to run to show how long before trial was commenced, how long before trial was concluded. So that, and this process is electronic, so even if as I'm sitting in this wonderful premises, I can look at my phone and see what is happening live in the DPP's office. Why has this case not been assigned? Why has this case not been arraigned? And so that technology will enable the DPP's office to be more efficient. It will enable prosecution to be more efficient. It will also eliminate the awaiting trial syndrome. When the news of 10 returns, Ogun State Government has also unveiled its justice tra transformation strategy, plus a first ever rice pyramid scheme unveiled in Ekiti State under the central bank's anchor borrowers program. We we'll have more business news. Join us again. Welcome back. The Ogun State Government has launched a civil justice transformation strategy policy draft document to strengthen the civil justice dispensation and administration in the state. Launching the policy document in Abelkota, the state capital, the state governor, Dakwa Biodun, said the document, among other things, will promote ease of doing business and attract more investments in the state and ensure equal access to justice. The launch of the policy draft document brings together members of the bar and bench members of the State Executive Council and development partners. The document seeks to bring civil justice dispensation and administration, promote justice, equity, fairness and transparency in the judicial system of Ogun State. The partnership with Hill culminated in the Ogun State Civil Justice Transformation Lab, a series of stakeholder dialogue sessions targeted at making people-centered justice a reality. The end product, the draft strategy document before you, is indeed autochthonous or homegrown. The lab strategy document. Unveiling the strategic draft document, the state governor commends the development partners for their efforts in ensuring civil justice system becomes people-centered and user-friendly. The creation of the Ogun State Civil Justice Transformation Lab strategy will afford all of us the opportunity to identify the most pressing justice needs of our people and provide innovative strategies to resolve them. This is because we are aware that inability of citizens to have their justice needs effectively resolved will have a negative impact on their welfare as well as business growth and investment action in the society. The country representative of the Hague Institute for Innovation of Law is optimistic that the partnership will promote human rights, rule of law, and the localization of civil justice processes. How will Ogun State gain?
It means that if somebody is quarreling with their neighbor, they don't have to file in court. If there's a, a legal framework for you to maybe go for mediation, and the mediator, mediation office is in your neighborhood, it's no longer, ah, you have to drive to Abiyokuta. Meanwhile, you live in Ota or somewhere. So the launch of the draft policy was rounded off with the presentation of certificates to participants of the Civil Justice Transformation Strategy. The document is expected to be passed into law by the Ogun State House of Assembly. Over now to Gloria Mizuke in Abuja for more on the news at 10. Hi, Gloria. Hello, Amarachi. Good to see you. A new national carrier is set to take off in the first quarter of 2022. The Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, told State House correspondents today that there was a forced postponement of the planned date for its establishment, which was earlier due by end of 2021, owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Aviation Minister explains that the Ministry would return to Council in two weeks to submit a memo with an outlined business case for the carrier for Council's approval. The minister is hopeful that the new national carrier, which according to him is long overdue, will be a viable airline that will cater to millions of travelers in Nigeria and Africa. The private sector run airline will be in operation by early 2022 with possibly cheaper rates. We're coming back to council, um, hopefully within the next two weeks to present the memo on the national carrier um, we went to council to approve the outline business case, outline business case for the carrier. And uh, then the council raised some questions and asked us to go and uh, um, fare the memo again and bring it back. So once it comes back and the outline business case is approved by council, then of course we will now go to the full business case, which is now going to the market and then, you know, establishing the national carrier. It is our uh, intention to have the national carrier running in 2021, which is this year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, which took the greater part of last year, since uh, March last year, activities are almost impossible. 200 million mobile people that travel sometimes almost for nothing. Sitting within the uh, West African sub-region, 400 million people. Contagos with Central Africa, 600 million people, twice the population of the U.S., equal to the population of the entire continental Europe, at the center of Africa, Nigeria, equal distance from all location, rising middle class, propensity to fly is high. Nigeria is the best candidate for a very robust career. The president is still in France and has been holding several meetings on the sidelines of the Financing Africa Summit. Today, President Mohamedou Buhari held meetings with the chief executives of Total, Airbus, Dassault Systems, General and Engineering and Donaflex Automotive. He urged the investors to further explore vast opportunities of human and natural resources in Nigeria, while assuring that fiscal policies will be more favorable, predictable and measurable measurably tilted towards creating harmonious business environment for them. He says, and I quote, we are very pleased with the evolving trends in technology which is currently driving development across the world and Nigeria. Nigeria is more of a gas country than a crude oil producing country. In the 80s, we generated more from gas than crude oil. In the 80s, we were earning more from gas for some years and had to put in place structures we intend to further explore the gas sector. I am pleased with your consistency in staying in Nigeria, end of quote. The president had a meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday, where they agreed to work together to fight insecurity in the Lake Chad Basin area and the entire stretch of the Sahel region. The Delta state government says it has activated a process to ensure that the 4.2 million pounds repatriated to Nigeria from the United Kingdom is handed over to the state. According to Governor Ifan Yokoa, letters have been sent to the presidency as well as the Attorney General of the Federation to ensure that the funds are either returned to the state coffers or used for infrastructural development in the state. According to Governor Ifan Yokoa, a letters 
He said this during an interactive session with the media at the government house in Asaba, the state capital. The 4.2 million pounds, uh, we got, got that you heard, I've just heard that it has been released to Nigeria. Action is in taking. We are following the due process bureaucratically, and I think that that's the best way to go. Uh, letters have been written, uh, letters of appeal to Mr. President, and we have also copied the attention of the Federation, and now that the money is there, we'll continue to uh, uh, pursue the intent of that letter, and we hope that we'll be able to receive the money, uh, because we have asked for two things. You see that the money is returned to us, or the money is applied to projects in Delta State. And we have suggested some projects to which the money can be applied. The 4.2 uh, million pounds is about 2.2, yeah. depending on the exchange rate, it's about 2.2 billion. Uh, it's quite some big money, but it, it, it can only be applicable to some projects. So we have suggested some projects in case they do not want to return it in cash to that as the government that should be applied to any of the projects that we have suggested. Meanwhile, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Abu Bakar Malami, has been reacting to arguments and threats of litigation trailing the loot recovered from the former Delta State Governor, James Iburi. He says the recovery is a mutual agreement between Nigeria and the United Kingdom and may not be subject to review owing to the limited sanctity of international diplomacy. The recovery is a function of mutual agreement. And mutual agreement has agreed between two nations. So it's not an issue that is exclusively within the powers of the federal government as it stands to revisit without recourse to United Kingdom from which country this for, I mean, these funds were recovered. So against the background of the fact that an agreement has been signed, against the background of the sanctity of an agreement, it is difficult within the limited consideration of the sanctity of an agreement, within the limited consideration of the international diplomacy to bring in new considerations after indeed the whole process has been consummated. Is there any other kind of fraud or loot that is out there that you are chasing that is of this magnitude that Nigerians need to know about? Well, uh, in all sincerity, what has been recovered over time will be a child's play if what we are pursuing eventually succeed in terms of recovery. Only yesterday, I had an elaborate meeting with some of the, I mean, with uh, a head of the security or perhaps an um, anti-corruption agency as to the strategy to be deployed in terms of recovery as it relates to a very heavy asset that has been, I mean, that has constituted a subject of investigation. We are pursuing a very heavy recovery relating to two personalities and uh, investigation intelligence and associated work relating to such recovery has advanced to uh, i mean uh, has reached an advanced stage and uh, i can assure you that with the collaboration the anti-corruption agencies we are having with the anti-corruption agencies with particular reference to efcc i see us making a great headway in terms of making monumental I call it monumental recovery of looted assets very soon. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's over now to Anne Wawodo in Lagos for Business News. Thank you, Gloria. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin in Ikita State, where the government is set to reawaken the edge it has in rice production as it becomes the first state in the southwest to unveil the Rice Pyramid Project Initiative 
of the federal government. The pyramid concept being undertaken by the Central Bank of Nigeria under the Anchor Borrowers Program is in partnership with Unity Bank as well as Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria to help strengthen food security in the country. These pyramids signal a bold return to agriculture, aligning with the call for economic diversification as the National Rice Pyramid Program is launched in Ekiti State with 278,000 metric tons of the grains in partnership with the Central Bank of Nigeria and Unity Bank. The governor of Ekiti State, Kayode Fayomi, says the state is ready to regain its ancestral position as a major player in the rice value chain. Ekiti used to be the leading rice producer for the entire western region of Nigeria and beyond. We're determined to regain our pride of place by building a successful generation of players in the rice value chain. For the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, speculations over lopsidedness in the Anchor Borrowers Program is inaccurate. More than 300 billion has been disbursed either through Anchor Borrowers Program or through states or to companies that are operating in the southern part of the country. Private sector player Unity Bank has been a major partner of the Central Bank on this agricultural initiative. It says it is determined to help Nigeria attain food security while assuring rice farmers in a kitty state of input support. At Unity Bank, we are ready to continue to give the necessary support to the federal government, the CBN, in terms of all the laudable projects they want to do to improve you know, the agricultural situation in Nigeria in order to provide uh, food, you know, so that we can be dependent on our own production and provide food security for the country. In 2019, Unity Bank won the Presidential Award of Recognition for the bank's strong participation in the Anchor Borrowers Program, and it expresses willingness to do more. The NSE All Share Index dropped further today, firming up the bearish grip on the local bulls as value of listed equities reduced by over 500 billion Nara in this week's three sessions. Uvie Bikomo tells us the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. I'm Uvie Bikomo. That growl by the bear signifies that its presence has become more pronounced in the local equities market as it extends its dominance for a third consecutive session. The main indicator of listed stocks fell below the 39,000 level, while about 339 billion naira is chopped off from the equities, which is just a few steps away from the 19 trillion naira mark. And you know why? Till Africa. The 10% drop from the market's third most capitalized stock was the major factor for the massive 1.48% dip recorded today, which also comes amid a negative market breadth of 25 losers against 20 gainers. It was also supported by sell pressure on key banking, insurance, and consumer goods sector components, while the 10% gain from SEPWAT only had a positive effect on the oil and gas sector. Airtel may have cast its red color on equities performance today while the total volume of equities transactions ended thinner, but with the market's dynamic nature, traders say they expect bargain hunters to take advantage of the lower price of some value stocks on Thursday's session. That's all for your Stock Market Report. I'm Uvie Bikomo. Thanks for watching Business News tonight. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Back to you, Marachi. At least 227 people have been killed in Gaza since fighting between Israel and Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip started last week. The health ministry says 64 of the dead are children, 38 are women, and 17 elderly people. On the side of the Israelis, 12 people have been killed, two of them children. Simon Pusey has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. 
Israel says there is no ceasefire agreement on the table and no time frame for when cross-border attacks in Gaza could end. Israel has conducted a wave of fresh airstrikes in Gaza. Among its targets has been a network of tunnels which Israel says is controlled by the Hamas militant group. Meanwhile, militants in Gaza are continuing to launch rocket attacks into Israel, mostly in the country's south. With an estimated 12,000 missiles and mortars in the Hamas and Islamic Jihad arsenals, an Israeli military spokesman said they still have enough rockets to fire. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has tweeted that his country's attacks will continue for as long as it takes to restore calm. Around half of the 8,000 migrants who have entered the Spanish enclave of Ceuta and Melilla this week have now been sent back. That's according to Spanish officials. <laughs> Dozens of young men queued up to re-enter Morocco and Moroccan police have now sealed the border area to prevent any more crossing attempts. The unprecedented numbers that crossed the border this week, counting in several thousands of individuals, have exacerbated diplomatic tensions between Spain and neighboring Morocco. The migrants, many using inflatable rings and rubber dinghies, started arriving in the early hours of Monday. An investigation of Donald Trump being carried out by the state of New York's attorney general is now a criminal inquiry. Down as much as they can play it down. A spokesman for the attorney general confirmed the office would be actively investigating the Trump organization in a criminal capacity. The inquiry has previously been branded a witch hunt by the former president. The inquiry will be looking into whether the Trump organization falsely reported property values to get loans and receive tax benefits. Concern is growing in India because of an antifungal drug used in the treatment of a rare infection called mucoomycosis, or black fungus, which is in short supply across several states. Amphotericin B, which is manufactured by many Indian firms, is also on sale on the black market. There are many emergency appeals on social media for the drug, as mucomycosis cases are on the rise. Doctors say the infection could be triggered by the use of steroids in severely ill COVID patients. Health authorities in Malawi have burnt almost 20,000 expired doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, saying it will reassure the public that any vaccines they do get are safe. The World Health Organization initially urged countries not to destroy expired doses, but has now changed its advice. Uptake of the vaccine in Malawi has been low, and health workers hope the move will increase public confidence. Malawi received 102,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine it acquired from the African Union on March the 26th. Argentine farm groups will halt trading of livestock in protest against a 30-day government ban on beef exports aimed at bringing down domestic prices. The Argentinian government unveiled the emergency measure, putting it on a potential collision course with the powerful farm sector that drives exports. The standoff underscores the fragile balance the government needs to strike between supporting farm exports and bringing down damaging runaway inflation that is set to near 50% this year. Argentina is the fifth largest world's beef exporter and has been increasing sales to markets like China. Footage posted online has gone viral in China after people were filmed running out of a skyscraper in Shenzhen after the building began to shake. Video shows office workers evacuating the 72-story skyscraper. Firefighters and police were soon on the scene. The Shenzhen Emergency Management Bureau said there had not been an earthquake at the time. And finally, Tom Hanks may have never played Forrest Gump in Japanese, but that's all set to change thanks to AI. Todas las noches leemos. Está listo, Jenny. A startup is offering a tool that can accurately recreate lip syncing without altering the performance of the actors. The tool studies in intricate detail all of the mouth movements an actor makes during the movie and swaps them out according to the dubbed words in different languages. <laughs> The company is now working with producers and studios to integrate the technology into post-production. The first films using the new tool are thought to be around a year man, away. Wir gestern gefeuert haben, klaut 3 Millionen Dollar. Wie wenn die Polizei sie sicherstellt uns mit einigen der bekanntesten und kriminellsten. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. The Algerian Ministry of Youth and Sports has announced the postponement of this year's African Senior Athletics Championships owing to its health situation linked to COVID-19. 
of the Athletics Championships, which was initially scheduled for June the 22nd to the 26th in Algiers, has now been moved to a later date. In the English Premier League, Tottenham Hotspur's hopes of securing European football have been dented as Aston Villa came from behind to claim a deserved victory at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. A two very late goals earned Arsenal all three points against three Crystal Palace. Everton kept their hopes alive of playing European football as Richarlison's header gave the Toffees victory over Wolver Wolverhampton Wanderers at Goodison Park. Joe Willock scored for the sixth successive game as Newcastle welcomed back fans to St. James's Park by beating relegated Sheffield United and Liverpool beat Burnley 3-0 away. And another football federation, the NFF, has announced that the Super Eagles will face CONCACAF Gold Cup holders Mexico in a friendly at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum on Saturday, July the 3rd. On the match will be the sixth confrontation between both sides, four of which have ended in draws. And that's new track. It's back to Marachi for the wrap. Thanks, Ayotunde. And the main news again. The Nigeria Liberal Congress today suspended its five-day warning strike in Kaduna State following federal government's decision to hold reconciliatory talks between the workers and the Kaduna State government. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night.